Then the two men from Emmaus told their story of how Jesus had appeared to them as they were walking along the road, and how they had recognized him as he was breaking the bread. And just as they were telling about it, Jesus himself was suddenly standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. But the whole group were startled and frightened, thinking they were seeing a ghost. Why are you so frightened, he asked. Why are your hearts filled with doubt? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. You can see that it's really me. Touch me and make sure that I am not a ghost. Because ghosts don't have bodies as you see that I do. As he spoke, he showed them his hands and his feet. Still they stood there in disbelief filled with joy and wonder. Then he asked them, Do you have anything here for me to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he ate it as they watched. Mm. Jesus appears to the disciples in Jerusalem. Then he said, When I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the Law of Moses and the Prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. And he said, Yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations, beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You are witnesses to all these things. And now I will send the Holy Spirit, just as my father promised. But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. Y'all remember how excited you were on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Day, and we talked about how important it is to remember that. It's Resurrection Day, it's Resurrection Sunday. Um, I, we often, churches across the globe, I mean, for years and years and years, it's, yay, it's Easter, Jesus, he's risen, he's risen indeed. And, and we are excited and we should be excited about that. And we should continue to be excited about that. And the excitement doesn't end on Resurrection Day. It should, if it does, then we're missing, we're missing out on a whole lot. Because all the stuff that happens after the resurrection is just as exciting, at least in my mind, it's very exciting to see what God does next, to see what Jesus does still here on earth. And last week, we talked about the, the two followers of Christ. They were, they were disciples. They weren't part of his inner circle, per se, but they were two disciples who were following Jesus, who were listening to his teachings, who experienced his death on the cross and they were mourning and they were sad and Jesus showed up and had a conversation with them and they didn't even know it 
And they were, they were a little clueless, and, and as often we're clueless as to what Christ is doing when He's right here among us. Uh, we can tend to forget that He is here, that He is alive and well. And when Jesus revealed Himself to these guys, what happened? Anybody remember? He vanished, but then what? I mean, they were believers, but they were really, really believers then because they're like, oh. he, he revealed himself as he broke the bread and gave thanks for it. And that moved us into our communion service, right? And as he did that, when they did that, when that happened, when he gone again, Jesus disappears before their eyes. They were so excited. They weren't even sad that he disappeared. They were so excited that they realized that it was Jesus telling them the story all along. And he was he brought to life and, I, and he brought to life God's word for them. He helped them see just how alive this book is. Yes. I know, I know. He told me. Yes. Hello. Right. And he, but he, he opened it up for them. And when they, when they, and, and they said, and they said to each other, did you feel how our hearts were burning as he was revealing the word to us? And he gave it to them in detail. Now, remember, they're walking a seven mile walk from Jerusalem to Emmaus. So it doesn't take much to drive seven miles, right? It's probably about 10 minutes, maybe, depending on how fast you drive. But when you're walking it, you have a whole... Jesus had enough time to talk about Moses all the way through the end of Malachi to these guys. And he, what he did was he pointed out every scripture that pointed to him as Messiah. So he disappears. What they do next? They hurried back to Jerusalem, and they're taking that seven-mile walk. All the way, I, 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 they might have had like a kind of double quick going at that point. I think they were so excited. And here, in, starting in verse 33, it shows, because it says at the end of 32, hold on a second here. Did our hearts not burn? within us while he talked to us on the road and while he opened the scriptures. And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem and they found the eleven. So, that very hour, Jesus broke bread with them. He's vanished before their eyes. They went back to find the eleven disciples. Right? And they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Okay, now that, that closed out what we finished up in last week's conversation. Today's scripture is where their story left off. So you look at verses 36. Let's just look at 36 to 39. Okay? And it says, As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands? See my feet? That it is I myself. 
Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And as Melody eloquently put it, I told you. I was coming back. Right? Another, I mean, you can't, you cannot defeat God's plan. I've been telling you guys this the whole time. And these two guys who were walking back, who just ran back from Emmaus, just told you everything that I told them. And you're still doubting. You're still doubting. Now, another gospel, which we'll get into not today, but another gospel even gets into deeper detail of this encounter with Jesus. There are so many things that happen just between the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus that we're going to be here for a while. We're going to, we're going to bounce through some of these, these accounts of Jesus and what happens with him after the resurrection. Because it's important to note these things. Okay? So, he says to them, peace to you. You know what it really probably he said? Shalom. Shalom. And, and, and you, you, that's how they would greet each other. Shalom. Peace to you. Or be at peace or if you were a teenager, chill out. <laughs> Calm down. Chillax. It's me. Come on. Right? So before the two followers from Emmaus came to confirm Jesus' appearance, the rest of the disciples were still mourning his death. Interestingly enough, they didn't believe the women when they told the eleven. Man, a big surprise there, right? We still have that issue sometimes, don't we? They had their man ears on, right? But it's true. I mean, if you read it, the only one who had seen Jesus at that point now had been Simon. It says that Simon had seen him. Simon Peter. Notice he calls him Simon at this point. And in a few weeks, we will get to that too. So all these messages that we're doing between Easter and however long it takes us to get to the end of this part, you're going to see why they call Peter Simon at this point. And if you know the answer, don't blow it. Because <laughs> I want to surprise those who don't. Because it's cool to see the reveal of what happened with Simon. Okay? So Simon had seen him. At this point. But the rest of them, they were not believing the women when they came back. And the women had literally seen Jesus. And we didn't even do the part last week uh, or on Easter this year where Mary had a full conversation with Jesus. And she didn't recognize him at first until he said her name. She thought he was a gardener. And then he goes, Mary, whoa, whoa. hold up. So it, with everybody, with the disciples, with all of his followers, with us grasping the immensity of who Jesus is, is always a process with people. Because A, we're hard-headed. B, we're stubborn. And C, we, it just takes us time sometimes to get there. Now, there are some of us who get it right away. I am not one of those people. It took me a while. And it was a process. And, but going through the process, trust, I always say, trust the process. Because it is. It's not a, like I said, I think it was last week I was talking about this. We live in a microwave thinking society. We want it to happen right now. We want answers right now. And it doesn't happen that way. God rarely works like a microwave. More often, God works like a big slow cooker. And it drives us nuts because we want, come on, give me the answers. Give me what I want to hear. Sometimes you don't ever get what you want to hear. But what you need to hear. I know it's hard, isn't it? It is. So they go and they tell the eleven. 
Just then, Jesus appears in the room. Shalom. Right? Shalom. They were all startled. <gasps> Can you imagine the disciples arguing back and forth about the women's story? Then all of a sudden, Jesus shows up. and He's like, hey, here I am. <laughs> is, is it possible that they were shocked on several levels? One, for, for one, it would be very startling to see someone you knew beyond a shadow of a doubt had died. And you've seen him die. You've seen him buried, right? The women seen this, okay? Two, they thought he was a ghost, right? And three, then there's the possible embarrassment when they realized it was Jesus in the flesh, embarrassed by their own doubt. Embarrassed by their own doubt that they doubted the women. Maybe they even doubted what Simon was saying. And here the boys from Emmaus were telling this very story of how Jesus appeared to them. And they were still trying to wrap their minds around the truth. I think this is why I think it is so important that all four Gospels include the women's testimonies. It's very, it's very, there, there's, a, there's a point to that. Because if it wasn't for their testimony, these guys would have kept going on in mourning and not fully grasping the full truth of the gospel. That Jesus had told them before he even died. A few times. It seems the inclusion of the women's testimonies is a response to the disciples' own doubt. Think about it. You read every single gospel, and it shows that the women were strongly involved in the first sightings of Jesus. But yet they go back and they tell the disciples, and the guys are like, yeah, okay. Sure. Right? They weren't. They weren't. They were not. They were doubting. So now you have the 11 disciples. You got the two from Emmaus who saw Jesus. You have the women who saw Jesus. And now Jesus in the flesh and Jesus questions their doubts. Jesus reveals himself to be alive and well. But these guys, these guys are shocked and scared. Honestly, I, if it would have been me, if I would have been in there, and I, and I probably would have been like, yeah, okay, yeah, you saw Jesus, sure, you did. yeah, right? Because that's just my human nature. But I would have been more embarrassed that I was doubting, especially after I remember going back to, remember what we talked about on Easter or on Resurrection Sunday is that the women had remembered Jesus' words way back when they were still in Galilee. And Jesus was telling them that these things were going to happen. So, let's look at 40 through 43. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. Now, the disciples are in a moment of absolute shock. I mean, imagine this. Think about it. How would you respond? You knew Jesus would be, had been killed. You knew he had been buried. You also knew that his body was missing. Uh, guys... It's Jesus. He's hungry. What do we do? He wants fish. Thankfully, they conveniently had just broiled some fish. Here you go. He's eating it. He likes it. Jesus really likes it. <laughs> Pastor 
dirty sauce. <laughs> Get some hummus. They're in shock. They're in absolute shock. Here is Jesus in the flesh. Not a ghost. Not a, some apparition. Jesus in the flesh. And what does he say? Guys, I'm hungry. You guys got something to eat. <laughs> Let's get over the shock. Bring the food. Okay? I am, you know, here in the flesh, right? So, let's keep tracking along with this idea, all right? Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. Now, is he perturbed? Is he being sarcastic? Or is he just gently reminding them? You interpret it how you will. These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. That everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. That's a key point. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And said to them, thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But say, stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. The disciples are like, he's talking. The Emmaus guys are like, this is what we've been telling you on the road. You did this, you did this thing and the thing, and he was talking about the prophets and the Psalms and the, yeah, this is what we were trying to tell you, right? And the women were like, we told you he was alive. <laughs> right? This became a pivotal moment in the life of the 11 disciples. Jesus opened the disciples' minds to understand the scriptures. All their questions they were wrestling with before. In this moment, Jesus gave them understanding. You'll see that God holds back sometimes. He holds us back sometimes because we might not be ready for the whole truth. And he, like I've said before, and I'll probably say it until I can't say it anymore, but he gives us a piece at a time, a little bit here, a little bit there, and you've got to trust him in the process. Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. Remember that, guys? I told you that. I was in Galilee. You were in Galilee. We're all sitting around. I told you these things. And the repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. So you need to stay here, fellas. Listen, guys, I need you to stay here until you are clothed with power from on high. If you don't know what that is, I'm not going to tell you until next week. But most of, you, most of you already know what that is. But he says clothed with power from on high. So he gives them marching orders. Jesus gives them the fully revealed rescue plan. This was God's rescue plan from the moment in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve were expelled from the Garden. This was all part of the plan. Way back in Genesis. And there was a process. Israel 
could have gotten to the promised land in about a week and a half. It took them how long? 40 years. 40 years. Not a week and a half, 40 years. Why? Because they had to go through a process. In fact, God brought them through a cleansing process. Because they were going through a process of doubt, disbelief. They weren't trusting God. They were whining and complaining about piddly things, even though God was providing for them. And yes, we still do that today, don't we? Unfortunately. we got to get past that kind of stuff. Because God wants to do, God can do so much more with us, with our, with our church families, with churches across the board, across the globe, however you want to look at it. And you put that doubt away. And you put your trust in him. As the proverb says, he will make your path straight. But these are the marching orders. This is what makes salvation possible. Christ had to die and on the third day rise from the dead. I mean, you can't shorten the gospel up any more than that. That's about as short as I can make that. There's sin. There has to be payment for sin. The ultimate payment of sin is death. Jesus chose to die for everyone here. And then he had to rise again, defeating death. And that's why we have salvation. End of story. Good day. Have a good day. <laughs> right? But that's it. That's the gospel in a nutshell. If you choose, and, and the beautiful and part of this is you get to choose it. You can choose. You can totally choose to deny all this. You can think I'm giving you, I'm blowing smoke in your ear. You can totally believe that. You have that right. But that means you're choosing to go the other way. That means you're choosing not to follow Jesus. You're choosing not to go to heaven. You're choosing to go to hell. No one likes to hear that, but that's the truth. Because this is, this is our... This is our foundation. This is our center. We center it on the Word of God, and that's exactly what this teaches. So, the marching orders are to proclaim the forgiveness of sins through repentance of sin. Good job, Mel, on the kids' moment, because it totally connects with what we're talking about. Um, we have repentance is turning around and knocking over the Ten Commandments. Um, but I didn't break them like Moses. Um, and, but you're turning around, you're turning away from sin, and you are turning to God. You're turning to Jesus. And Jesus is the way to God. The only way. Right? John 14, 6. I'm not going to quote it. Look it up. John 14, 6. All right? You're turning away from sin. That's what repentance is. Repentance isn't going, I'm sorry, and then going and sinning again. I'm sorry, and then going and sinning again. Repentance is literally turning away from And that's a lot more work. Okay? I'm sorry is confession. Confession is the first step. You've got to confess. Man, I got issues. I have sin. I struggle with things. This is what I struggle with. I'm confessing that. Great. Good job. Now, ask for forgiveness. He will forgive you. But then the repentance is literally turning away from that sin and turning to Jesus. You turn your back on the sin. That's a lot more work. It takes a lot more time because you are going to Probably do it again, even though you're sorry. What's that? Yeah, really. It, it stinks because we, we have to continually battle our flesh nature, our sin nature. Anybody who's ever wrestled with addiction knows what I'm talking about. 
whether it's, it could be drugs, it could be alcohol, it could be cigarettes, it could be food. You know, food for me is an addiction. And gluttony is an issue. You can't, I, you can't call it anything else. But to turn away from it, that's a lot more work. I've been sorry for my sins for years. It's way more work to try and make myself make the right choices. And I can't do it on my own, but I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, right? And when we lean on him for that strength and that help, he will help us. So the marching orders proclaim forgiveness of sins through repentance of sins. Proclaim this to all nations. But he said to them, start in Jerusalem. Stay here. Stay in, the, stay in Jerusalem. Stay there until you are clothed with power from on high. Stay there. Don't, don't go yet. Hold on, guys. Of course, they didn't want to. They were kind of, they were kind of scared because they got, not only do they have the Romans after them now, but they got the Pharisees after them. They're, they're terrified at this point. So they're like, I ain't going anywhere. I'm not leaving this room. Right? Yeah, they have the door locked and everything. How'd you get in, Jesus? <laughs> Shalom. <laughs> I know he probably didn't do it the way I interpreted it, but that's just how my brain sees. He just, Shalom. Here I am, boys. Listen up. Here we go. Because he said, stay there until you are clothed with power from on high. And we're going to get into that a little bit more in the coming weeks. But for right now, what they do know, beyond a shadow of any doubt that they had had at this point, up to this point, they now knew with no doubt that Jesus is back. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. As the worship team gets ready to close us in song, if you have not yet made that commitment to follow Christ, if you have not decided, I'm going to follow Jesus with my life, this, in any moment, actually every breath you ever have, is an opportunity for you to ask Him to be your Lord and Savior. It is an opportunity for you to choose to follow Him. And if this message, maybe it's pulling on your heartstrings. I don't know. Only you know that. God knows that. This is your opportunity. You can come up front. I'll pray with you. Encourage you. If you don't feel comfortable doing that, man, you can see me after church. I'd love to talk with you. We've got people who would love to pray with you. Um, you want to do it in your car while you're driving home. He'll hear you there. It doesn't matter where you're at. He can hear that prayer. He hears the prayers of our hearts. What I do know is that Jesus wants every person, every individual, every human being to follow him. The sad part of that story is that there are going to be people who choose not to. And that's what breaks my heart. Our biggest, most important thing, no matter what style of music we're doing, what our church looks like, what, how we dress, beyond any of that stuff, the most important thing is that people follow Jesus. And that's, that's our goal here in North Athens, is that you come to know Jesus. And you got to ask yourself, what's holding me back? And you can't blame anybody but yourself. You're the only one who can stop you from choosing to follow Jesus. You realize that? No other human being can do that. They don't have that kind of power. So what are you waiting for? Ask him to be your Lord and Savior. Recognize, man, I got sin. I need someone to help me overcome it. Think about that as we sing these words to the song here.
more precious than diamond, silver, gold, anything in this world. You are more precious than all those things. And we absolutely need you in our lives. And we ask that if there are people here today who are struggling to make that choice, that decision to follow you, that you will, that you will keep pulling on their heartstrings, Lord God, and that you will draw them in and invite them in to your presence. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.